Let us stand for the reading of God's word. I'll read first in English and then we'll follow in Chinese. Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Lord, again, we thank you for blessing our church in many ways. But the main blessing that you give us is, is your word and your, and your Holy Spirit. And so we ask, Lord, you, that you would pour your spirit upon us now, Lord, as we hear from your word, as we seek to discern your will for us. Indeed, as we have heard of covenant obligations, Lord, help us to fulfill, Lord, as we hear your spirit speaking to us, those very obligations that you put upon us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me uh, begin by reminding everyone what vows are. Since after all, we just witnessed some vows. If you are, ever try to download something on the internet or you, you try to, I don't know, uh, make a new email address, you have to hit next, next. You have to agree to the, like a legal mumbo jumbo. You know, you don't read that stuff. You just hit next, next, next. Vows are not like that. Vows are made before God. God, who is the living, the living God, He is judge over all. He will hold us to account for our vows, whether or not, whether or not we keep them. Given the utter seriousness of vows, let me bolster my case to you now to listen up and heed well. Because this passage and my sermon touches on at least three of our membership vows. Question three, I, don't, I know none of you have memorized it, but we, we asked the three uh, candidates for uh, confirmation and baptism. Question three was, do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor, that is, you will strive to live as is appropriate for a follower of Christ? So our passage today is, is about living as a follower of Jesus Christ. 
But also question five from the membership vows is, do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to devote yourself to its purity and peace? Our, our passage is about the peace of the church. In, in fact, one of the questions to the deacon, deacons is, will you work for the peace, the purity and the peace of the church? And then question four was, do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? Every member of the church is promised, if you are a member of this church, you have promised, you have vowed to support the church in its worship and work. Supporting the church in its worship and work is not the job of a, a few special co-workers. Rather, if you have joined our church as a member, you are a co-worker. Now, this passage is not about being a co-worker in the church. But the two women in this passage, Euodia and Syntyche, they are described as co-workers. Now, when you, when you read that, that doesn't mean, ah, this, what Paul is commanding them, or he's urging them to, this only applies to a higher class of Christian. No, when he calls them a co-worker, he's calling them what you are as well. If you are a member of this church, then you also are, are a co-worker. And so this passage is applicable to co-workers, excuse me, to officers in the church, but also the member who is not an officer, you're, you're here sitting in the pews, you also are a co-worker, this passage is about you too. Now here's the situation, these two women disagree. Uh, they're of different minds. Now, what is the nature of this conflict? We're not given any details. But it must have been serious enough that when Paul, when he's in prison, and he hears reports about how the Philippian church is doing, uh, they tell him that there is this conflict in the church between Euodia and Syntyche. So at its heart, what we're talking about is a disagreement, a disagreement to the point of breaking fellowship. A disagreement that harms the unity and the peace of the church. Now, I want to be clear here, having a disagreement or being in a conflict is not sin in and of itself. 
清楚的是说，呃，在教会里面有不同的意见，呃，本身并不是罪。Don't hear me saying today, you must avoid conflict. I'm not saying steer clear of confrontation. I'm not saying、uh, don't believe in anything, don't insist on anything. The biblical ethic is not avoid conflict. Now we've got to admit, though, that often, very often, conflicts reveal sin in our hearts. Galatians five lists many works of the flesh. They call them works of the flesh. And so, certainly, in our conflicts, perhaps we have we we what our hearts reveal is enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy. Now, if our hearts reveal such sins, of course we must repent. We must turn away from our sins and turn back to the Lord and receive forgiveness. But, but conflict does not always mean that those sins are present. What if you just fall on different sides of an issue? Simply, you just have different minds. You're you're just not on the same page. Just because you find yourself in a conflict does not mean that you have sinned or that the other party has sinned, and you need to repent. That said, the Lord Jesus, through His Word, He does put certain obligations upon us when when we find ourselves in the midst of a conflict. Now, the type of conflict in view here in this passage is when both parties are believers. Both Euodia and Syntyche are co-workers in the gospel. Have you ever found yourself in this situation? You, a follower of Jesus Christ, are in a conflict with another brother or sister、uh, in Christ. Of course, you have. Perhaps you're in a conflict with a with a with a person right now, maybe sitting next to them. We, we in the church are no strangers to conflict with each other. Whether it's the church. In the local church here, or in the family. In our Christian homes, where where we pledge allegiance to Jesus Christ our Lord, yet there is conflict within within our families. But the presence of conflict is not necessarily the problem. But 
how you and I respond to the conflict, that is the test. Verse 2 here, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche, agree in the Lord. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul writing a letter to our church, or maybe to your family, saying, I entreat Charles, and I entreat JQ, agree in the Lord. But of course, this entreaty is not only from the Apostle. The Apostle speaks for Jesus. So here, Jesus, he says to you and me in the midst of our conflicts with our brothers and sisters in Christ, I urge you and I urge you to agree in me. Now, this does not mean just stop arguing. Sometimes when our, my children are quarreling, uh, this is, I don't recommend this, but sometimes in my impatience, I say, be quiet. Of course, that is not true peace. That's fake peace, not true peacemaking. There is a positive command here, which is to be of the same mind in the Lord. Paul is not saying, quit it. Rather, he's saying, come together in the Lord. This is not brute force. You got to just agree. This is not one person overpowering or domineering over the other. Right? Paul says both their names. He says, I entreat Euodia, I entreat Syntyche. Come together. Work together to get on the same page. Work toward true unity. Now, let's, let's think about this. If you're paying attention, I hope you're thinking what I'm about to say. Well, not I hope, but I, I, I think you, sh you probably are thinking what I'm going to say. This is difficult. This is exceedingly difficult. Perhaps impossible. If it's not in the Lord. That is the crucial piece here. The ex exhortation is not I entreat Iodia Syntyche, agree. The exhortation is, agree in the Lord. There is a world of difference between agree and agree in the Lord. It changes everything. Do you ever wonder when you're in the middle of an argument? What kind of agreement is possible? There's no common ground. There is no uh, same page that we can even work toward. 
Now, that, that may be true when you are in a conflict with someone who is an unbeliever. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says, what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? But if you are both believers, if both your names are written in the book of life, then you both share not just some common ground, but you have ultimate unity in the most important things. So to ask again, what kind of agreement is possible? Well, this common ground is, the common ground between you and another believer is the Lord. You are both in the Lord. And how can we agree? Again, the answer, the answer is in the Lord. That is, how I will work to get on the same page with this person I'm in a conflict with is as the Lord works in me. It is as the Lord changes my heart to loosen my grip on my pride and my self-righteousness and my self-centered desires. And as, he, as the Lord gives me more of His Holy Spirit, and He gives me more of His desires, I can die to the desires of my flesh. And why would you agree? Not for your own sake, not for the sake of this other person, or for agreement's sake, rather the reason you are to agree is for the Lord's sake. That one phrase, in the Lord, changes everything. which behooves us to ask ourselves in the midst of our conflicts, this is a very critical question, we must ask ourselves this, where is the Lord in this conflict? You can see, if the Lord is not present, well, you cannot obey this command. And perhaps that is the reason why our conflicts persist and they fester and they sour and they grow bitter because the Lord is absent. Is Jesus uninvited and unwelcome? Let us soberly consider that possibility. And if so, let us turn to him. Brothers and sisters, this call to agree in the Lord, it is primary, it is paramount. It, it's not secondary or optional. Oh, but pastor, don't you see that Paul is writing to the church, to that, that church, and he's actually addressing Euodia and Syntyche. He's not writing to us.
But in fact, if you read earlier in Philippians, he, it, the Apostle Paul emphasizes over and over again to be of one mind, strive to be of one spirit, together, being of full accord, together, one mind, one spirit. And this theme of unity is not just found in the book of Philippians, it is found throughout the New Testament. If you, if you just open your eyes, you just scan through the New Testament, it's everywhere. We must pursue it. Now, obeying this call will not always yield the expected result. In other words, if Euodia here, he, she really obeys the call to agree in the Lord, it doesn't necessarily mean that Syntyche will follow through. Or even if both parties, to some degree, seek to pursue this unity, it doesn't always mean that the, we will we all have this perfect unity uh, in the church or in this life. We, un we understand that we're not going to reach perfection until Jesus returns. But knowing that we will not be perfect in this life does not excuse us from the call to obedience. The Lord does not call us to perfection, rather He calls us to obedience. So, let us not disregard or neglect this call. To ignore the word of the Lord is to disobey. Can you imagine Euodia saying her first response is, but what about Syntyche? She's not listening either. This is why the apostle calls both their names. He says, I call Euodia, I call Syntyche. That means that Yodia does not have to worry about Syntyche. And Syntyche does, need, does not need to worry about what Yodia is doing. The, the call for each person is to themselves. You're saying, oh no, it's still too difficult. True as that may be, remember what Jesus says to us. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is a question of faith. Will you take his yoke on, upon yourself? Do you believe that his yoke is easy and that his burden is light? Will you trust the Lord enough to discover how truly gentle and lowly in heart he is? Will you believe his words? Now, there may be a simple reason why you disobey this call.
A very simple reason that you might refuse to agree in the Lord is because maybe you're not in the Lord. Perhaps you are self-deceived about your faith. If you find that you cannot or you will not heed this exhortation, you must examine yourself. See whether or not you are really in the faith. Finally, this is how important it is that Euodia and Syntyche come to be of the same mind. If you look at the third verse here, the Apostle Paul recruits a third party, someone who's not involved in the conflict, a person he calls true companion, he calls him to get involved. He tells true companion, help these women. While this passage does not give us license now to meddle and to pry in matters that have nothing to do with us, I think most of us face the opposite temptation. Usually, we don't want to get involved. It's too messy. Too difficult. Now certainly we acknowledge that judgment and wisdom are necessary. But let us not forget the call to true companion here, to help our brothers and sisters when they are in conflict. That is, if you are in a position to help, you should help. Yes, walk alongside these two. Do the difficult work of a mediator. Because to do so is to walk in the footsteps, the footsteps of Jesus, who is our true companion. Let us remember Jesus. He did not stay on the sidelines. He didn't say, oh, it's too messy, too difficult. Jesus got his hands dirty in order to reconcile us to God. Jesus shed his own blood and his body was broken as our mediator. And because of Jesus, now we are reconciled to God through him, but also to one another. Let me close with one more one more reason why this command is so important. Uh, a little bit later, we're going to sing a communion hymn which contains these lyrics. So we share in this bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of peace around the table of the king. You don't have to sing that.
Among the many things that we do in communion, one of the main things it, we testify of our unity. When we share, I mean, technically, it's especially during COVID, it's different pieces of bread, but the symbolism is we're eating off the same piece of bread, broken for us. The symbolism is our communion, our fellowship. Therefore, if you, if you are unrepentant in, in that you refuse to seek unity in the church or in your life, if you refuse to repent and to if you refuse to seek unity, then you must not partake in the Lord's Supper. But if, on the other hand, you recognize your weakness and your inability to keep this command, But you desire to follow after the Lord and obey Him and honor Him, come near so that Christ Himself will fill up what is lacking in you. Let us pray. Lord God, we we hear this entreaty from the Apostle Paul, not only to you, Odia and Syntyche, but to us. It is so difficult. But we, but we thank you that you do not call us to do it in our own strength. You have given us your spirit and you have given us yourself. Indeed, as we draw near to you in this table, we see and we touch and we, we smell, Lord, your, your body and your blood broken and shed for us. Give us the faith that we need to hear and to obey. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to respond with a uh, quick response song and then we will.